are going to tear down the altar of the idol of sexual immorality. If you are struggling with sexual sin in your life, or if you have sexual sin in your life and you didn't even really ever struggle with it before, but now you're entering into this discipleship journey with Jesus and you're learning uh, that you have to cleanse yourself of these things, wherever you are in your walk, God is coming to speak to you today on this subject. And what we're going to look at today is the connection between worship and sex, why uh, God considers sex to be a holy thing when it's done the right way and the most detestable thing when it's done the wrong way. And we're also going to look at the consequences for you if you refuse to cleanse your house of sexual immorality. So we're going to start out by looking at Genesis 2.21. It says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Okay, so here we see where this relationship was started, this proper and holy relationship between a husband and a wife. And we see that this relationship um, is a a shadow for us of actually our relationship as the church with Jesus Christ. We're going to see this in Ephesians 1, 4, where it says, For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight in love, just as Eve came out of Adam. She was inside of Adam and God took her out of Adam's side and then they came back together to become one flesh. In the same way, it says he chose us, the church in Christ before the foundation of the world. And why did he choose us? So that we could be holy and unblemished in his sight in love. It's important to God that we honor uh, marriage and the marriage bed because he wants us to understand the holiness of the religion relationship that we have with Jesus Christ and the nature of that relationship. As it says in Hebrews 13, for a marriage must be honored among all and the marriage bed kept undefiled or pure for God will judge sexually immoral people and adulterers. Okay, so here we see that God considers sex between a man and a wife to be a holy and a pure thing. Okay, there's nothing um, shameful about it when it's done in the way that God ordains. It's a holy thing. And we see that with Adam and Eve, the pure innocence that they had with one another, that they were naked and they didn't even know it. They didn't even notice because there was no shame for them. And we can really understand that because within the confines of a marriage, uh, that, that kind of relationship, there's no shame in it. It's absolutely beautiful. It is holy and it is ordained by God. And you can see that not only was their relationship with one another completely pure, but their relationship with God was also pure because they were not conscious of their nakedness before God either. And what God is showing you today is what happens when you allow an outside influence to come into that holy relationship and um, to defile it is that that pure and holy and innocent thing is turned into shame. Okay, with Adam and Eve, they noticed that they were naked before God because they had allowed another spiritual being, namely Satan, to come in and and to master them. When Adam and Eve chose to obey Satan instead of God by doing Satan's will, they introduced idolatry into the world. And what we see in scripture is that to God, idolatry is adultery. And I'm going to read that to you in Ezekiel 23, 36 through 39. Um, You can find this all throughout the scriptures where God um, compares idolatry um, to adultery. It says, then confirm Front them with their detestable practices, for they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. They committed adultery with their idols. They even sacrificed their children, whom they bore to me, as food for them. They have also done this to me. At that same time, they defiled my sanctuary and desecrated my Sabbaths. On the very day they sacrificed their children to their idols, they entered my sanctuary and desecrated it. That is what they did in my 
house. Okay, so in order to understand what God is saying here, first of all, you have to understand that his relationship with us is the same as the relationship between Adam and Eve in that God has always called his people his wife. And God has told us that as the church, we are Christ's wife. Okay, so whenever we allow another entity to come in and control us or master us, we are allowing that entity to take his place. And um, it's the same to him as cheating on your husband. Okay, but you're cheating on God. You're committing adultery against God. And here he talks about um, his Sabbaths and his temple. Okay, and you'll notice that he said they defiled my sanctuary. Okay, so when we're talking about um, sexual immorality, as it said, you have to keep the marriage bed undefiled or pure. What you need to understand is that that is such an exclusive relationship that even the thought of allowing another person or another entity to come in and um, to be included in that in any way, even the thought of it, Jesus said, if you even lust after another woman, that, that you have committed adultery. Okay, even the thought of it is is impure. It's adultery. It is sin. And if you love somebody, you understand, you know, that's a jealous love. You're not going to share that person. You're not going to say, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sleep with whoever you want. Okay, that's not love. You can have more than one friend, right? You have brothers or sisters. You can have more than one of them. But when it comes to the husband wife relationship and the marriage bed, there is no room for anybody else. Okay, and that's what God says about his relationship with us. He said he will not share his glory with another. He will not allow his own wife to bow down to other gods or other idols. He won't allow his people to do that. He said, you shall not do this. You shall not bow down to any idols. You shall have no other gods before me. He said his love is a jealous love. Okay. And you can see this in marriage that all it takes for that marriage bed to be defiled is for the exclusive nature of it to be broken when it is not respected and when it is not treated as holy, it actually becomes the most depraved thing. Whenever people um, give themselves over to sexual immorality, uh, what comes to them is shame, okay? Just like we see with Adam and Eve. They realized with one another that they were naked, but they also realized before God that they were naked. And understand, that's because their relationship with him had been defiled, okay? The innocence had been robbed from their relationship because they allowed something else to come in and break the exclusive nature of that relationship. They didn't even know that there was any shame in their nakedness until their nakedness was exposed to somebody that it wasn't supposed to be exposed to. Okay, so understand there's a safe place um, for these behaviors. There's a safe place for us to worship. If we worship God, it's a pure thing. It's an innocent thing. It's a holy thing. But if we take that worship and we allow somebody else to come in and break the exclusive nature of that relationship by bowing down to something else, by worshiping something else, then to God, it is adultery. And what it does is it defiles what he says is his sanctuary, his Sabbaths, and his temple. From the beginning, we see that it has been God's heart to make a place amongst his people that he could dwell. He wants to dwell within his city, as he calls it, or his temple. And we see now that through Christ, we have become the temple of God. As it says in 1 Corinthians 3, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. You are the place that God has chosen to find his rest. He wants to make his dwelling place inside of you. Okay. And we see this in the song of Solomon in this beautiful prophetic uh, song about the relationship between Christ and his bride. The bridegroom calls his bride, his garden, and he says he's going to come into his garden. So God pictures his wife, um, his counterpart as the place where he makes his home and the place um, where he dwells. And in this story of of Israel and in our own stories, as we walk this out with the Lord, we see that wherever there has been idolatry, God's temple 
becomes defiled. Now we know that we are his temple. Okay. So we understand this is the place where God wants to live, but it is a place that has exclusive rules, right? And they're not rules so that we can't have any fun. They're rules because this is a holy relationship. It's an exclusive relationship. It's one that we are privileged to be in with God, the King, you know, he is the maker of the universe and yet he wants to be intimately acquainted with us, but he requires that we respect the fact that it is exclusive. Okay. And understanding that you are God's temple. I want to show you what happens to a temple whenever something else is allowed to come in to that temple and to defile it. This is found in Ezekiel chapter eight and Ezekiel is having a vision from the Lord and the spirit of the Lord has taken him up to Jerusalem, to the temple of God. And verse five says, then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked and in the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. Some uh, translations call it the idol that provokes to jealousy. Verse six, and he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the house of Israel is doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see things that are even more detestable. Okay, stop there. Okay, what I want you to notice, the result when they brought an idol into their temple was that God said it was going to drive him far from his sanctuary. Okay, understand he said that he is not going to share his glory. Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and detestable animals and all the idols of the house of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of the house of Israel and Jezaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. He said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Again, he said, you will see them doing things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance to the north gate of the house of the Lord. And I saw women sitting there mourning for Tammuz. He said to me, do you see this son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. Then he brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the entrance to the temple between the portico and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, have you seen the son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the house of Judah to do the detestable things that they are doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually provoke me to anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Okay. And then it goes on to talk about God's judgment on the temple, how God's glory departs from the temple. And um, it's a very, actually a very uh, violent judgment. Okay. And that's the scripture that I read to you at the beginning. Uh, Proverbs 6, 34, it says, for jealousy kindles a husband's rage and he will not show mercy when he takes revenge. So these are the two things you need to understand wherever you have an idol today. Um, if you set up an idol in this temple, cause you are God's temple. First of all, it's going to drive him far from his sanctuary. As I read to you in that scripture in Ezekiel 23, if you go and you offer sacrifices to God, you know, say you go to church or you go to Bible study, um, or, you know, you go and you do these spiritual things or have these spiritual conversations and, um, and, you know, act like you're a Christian, um, on one hand, but then you continue, um, to worship your idols on the other hand, that's just what they were doing. You know, he says, you sacrifice your children to your idols. And then you come to my temple and you try to bring gifts to me. He's like, that doesn't work. Okay. He's not impressed uh, because we're doing something religious. Understand he looks at our heart. And if we are violating the exclusive nature of our relationship with him, where we worship him as the only true God, then, you know, our marriage bed is defiled with him. 
Understand, and that temple, this temple becomes completely defiled, okay? So number one, bring in an idol, he's gonna leave, okay? You can pretend all day long that you have a relationship, but it says it's gonna drive him far from his sanctuary. And number two, it is going to kindle that jealous anger and there are going to be consequences. And we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16, where it says they made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. They sacrificed to demons, which are not God, gods they had not known, gods that recently appeared, gods your fathers did not fear. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Okay, so we do not want to kindle God's jealous anger. And something I want you to notice here is that whenever they were bowing down to idols, it says that they were bowing down to demons. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that you can't do that. Okay, if you want to have a relationship with God, you cannot have a both ways. It says, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? This is what the Lord is saying to you today. Okay, this is where um, the rubber meets the road in your life. Idolatry is a adultery to God and understand that the way that you use your body is an expression of the way that you worship God, especially when it comes to sex. If you do it in the way that God prescribed within um, the covenant of a marriage, then it is a pure and holy and innocent and beautiful thing. And it is a reflection of the pure worship that we have towards God. But whenever you do it in a way that um, is not prescribed by God, whenever you break that exclusive nature of that relationship, um, Um, and you expose yourself to someone that you're not in that relationship with, then you expose yourself and it becomes shame, okay? And you become defiled, all right? So we don't want to defile God's temple. We don't want him to go far from us, do we? So we are making a decision to purify ourselves, to ask God to forgive us, to ask God to cleanse us of all of our sin and to no longer remember those adulteries, but to wash us with the pure water of the word, to make us a pure and spotless bride. Okay, so put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. The reason that God wants you to lay down your sexual immorality is because he wants to have a pure and intimate and satisfying relationship with you. Okay. It's not because he doesn't want you um, to do anything that's enjoyable. It's because he wants to give you ultimate satisfaction and he wants to get that satisfaction from you as well. Okay. But he knows, and you need to know, just like, you know, with, with a husband and a wife, the only way that that relationship is going to work is if it is a completely exclusive relationship. So you've got to get rid of the idolatry in your life and especially sexual immorality, because it says in first Corinthians chapter six, the body body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. 
flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So if you are struggling with sexual immorality in your life, if you have sexual immorality in your life, then understand this is what God is requiring of you today. If you're not married, then you need to abstain from sexual relationships until you are. Okay. And then when you are married, you need to keep that relationship pure and undefiled and not go outside of that relationship. Understanding that whatever you do, you are a part of Christ. Okay. You can't take the members of Christ's body and go off and do these detestable things. Okay. Because because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 6, 9, just a little earlier in that chapter, tells us what the consequences of that will be because it says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to escape the wrath of God, if you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, then there's only one way. You have to be washed of these things. And if you keep these things in your life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says, do not be deceived, okay? Don't be tricked. You can't have it both ways. So I'm going to pray for those of you who are struggling with sexual immorality um, today, but any of you who have been convicted of any idolatry in your heart, any of these things on this list, I want you to pray with me as well, and God is going to wash you today. Father, I thank you for this promise that you will justify us when we come to you, that you will purify us when we come to you, because it's a very difficult thing when you um, have committed adultery against your spouse to go and let them know that you have committed this horrible sin against them. It is hard for us as well, Lord God, to bear our souls to you and to really admit um, that um, our idolatry is as detestable as it is and to identify it for what it is. It's unfaithfulness towards you. And Lord God, we want to be free of these things. Um, and I want to pray um, for each of the people who are listening today. First of all, whatever idolatry is in their hearts, I pray that you would flesh it out. I pray that you would refine us all, Lord God, and that you would get rid of these things in our lives today as the church. Um, I also pray specifically for those who are struggling with sexual immorality today. I pray that you would show them the wisdom um, that you give in saying that we should flee from sexual immorality. You said in your word that no temptation has come to us that is too great for us. You're not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we can handle. But every time there's a temptation, you have given us a way out. And we know that that way out is written in your word. If we will follow the instructions in your word, we will be saved from these traps and these snares. And we're also promised that if we will resist those temptations and we will submit to you and do what you tell us to do, then Satan is going to flee from us, even if it's something that has held us in bondage for years. This is the promise that we have from you, Lord God. So I pray for each and every person here that you would help them to submit um, to your will today, to flee from sexual immorality, to take that way out that you have given to them. And also I pray that you would deliver them from the demonic forces that have moved into that temple as a result of opening up their temple um, to other things besides you, Lord God. I pray that you would wash them clean and I cast out every unclean spirit that has taken up habitation in each of these dear people of God. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I command you to come out of them and you are not to come back to this house again. You will not inhabit that temple again. This temple is set apart and holy and sanctified and is being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit right now uh, with a strong man that is going to guard it and that strong man is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and God the Father. They have promised that they're coming in to inhabit these people right now, these people's lives. And Lord God, I pray that you would guard them, Lord God, as your holy temple, as you know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, Lord God. We know that in our own power, we can't break these addictions. We can't break um, the, these bad behavior patterns that we have in our relationships with people or um, the, the addictions that people have to pornography. We can't do these things on our own, Lord God. We don't have the 
the strength to do it. Our willpower isn't enough, but we are exerting all of our willpower in order to resist the devil, even though we may know from experience that that isn't strong enough in and of itself to get away from it. We know that that's the first step to having victory because you said we have to resist the devil before um, he will flee from us. So I pray that you would help them uh, to resist uh, sexual immorality. I pray that you would help them to submit to your word, um, that you would bring your word to them and show them uh, where you want them to obey and help them to understand that every step of obedience that they take, that is a step that is leading them to victory over all of these other areas, even if they don't see the connection. Because whenever we bow our knee to you, then there is no room for any other God in our life and any other master is going to have to leave, Lord God. So I pray that you would break these addictions in the name of Jesus and um, these, these places of idolatry, any bondage that's there. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are cleansing your temple today, that you are raising up a church that is a bride without spot or wrinkle. I pray that you'd help us to continue to allow you to reveal these things in our lives so that we may be acceptable to you on the day that we are presented to you. We want to be pleasing in your sight, Lord God. And I praise you for the victories that you are bringing in people's lives right now, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. If you need prayer today, please click on the prayer and decision button. If you're making a decision to tear down the altar of an idol in your life today, let us know. As the scriptures say, we should confess our sins to one another. Um, We want you um, to have a place where you can come and say, hey, I am making this decision. I'm making this commitment to God today. And uh, we want to hear about what God is doing in your life. And until I see you next time, remember to read your Bible and do what it says. Yeah.